I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Align Podcast. Welcome back to the Align Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's beautiful episode, I got to have Neil Strauss on the program. Neil is one of the most renowned writers on planet Earth. He's got uh, seven New York Times bestselling books. Um, he's written for most of the major magazines. He's written with Marilyn Manson, all sorts of really fascinating people. Uh, the Truth is his most recent one that I highly recommend people checking out. Uh, the Game, Rules of the Game. He's dope. He's one of my favorite thinkers here on this planet, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy this conversation. We get into a plethora of different topics, ranging from my own weird relationship with my family. He kind of uh, helps me observe my mind in ways that I hadn't necessarily necessarily perceived before. Time management, all sorts of great stuff. I hope you guys love this conversation. Thank you so much for tuning into the website, aligntherapy.com, A-L-I-G-N therapy.com. On there, you can start the five-day movement challenge. Start integrating more effective movement into every aspect of your day. The way that we sit, stand, walk, breathe, all that forms your body. And that five-day video series helps you all out with that. Wanted to thank Faraday's for supporting this podcast. They've been my go-to underpants for the last like four or five months. They have, I call it a silver line nut pouch. I'm sure that's like offensive or not accurate in some way, but um, around the groin, there is a pouch for your genitals that is laced with silver fibers, which can uh, block EMF, electromagnetic frequencies from hitting your balls if you're a guy. Uh, really great product. I love them. Um, they're made of bamboo and spandex. They're stretchy. Um, they're just, it's a good product. I recommend checking them out. And you get a free pair. Uh, just go to faradays.co, F A R A D A Y S.co. Type in a line at checkout and you get a free uh, sample pair. Uh, just pay shipping. It's like three bucks or something like that. It's underwear. So check that out. Thank you so much, Fair Days, for supporting this podcast. And thank you guys for supporting this podcast by leaving reviews, doing all that stuff. I think we should go. Oh, come out to Auburn Marcus Weekend here September, September, November 9th, 9th, 10th, and 11th here in Santa Monica at Lowe's Hotel. Uh, myself, Aubrey Marcus, Christine Hassler, Chris Ryan, Duncan Trussell, Kyle Kingsbury, Whitney Miller, blah, blah. Um, it's going to be really great. Bunch of bunch of interesting people coming together. And we're going to get weird. We're going to do like ecstatic dancing and various different workshops of all kinds and it's gonna be great so tickets are still available you can jump on to Aubrey's page for all that stuff and um, I look forward to seeing you guys there thank you so much for tuning in this podcast here we go with one of my favorite thinkers in the world Neil Strauss Pow. Align Podcast I'll tell you another great lesson from him that I was thinking about the other day was when you're teaching like a child is born uh, in the most spiritual place possible which is they're connected to the oneness right and when I'm starting to teach him that's a ball, that's a table, that's a uh, water. I'm teaching him separation. Mm -hmm. In other words, he begins in a place that all spiritual people are trying to get to, which is the oneness, and now I'm teaching him separation, which is something later in life he's gonna have to unlearn. I almost feel guilty teaching him separation (laughs) because he's already in the highest place there is. Unfortunately, you kind of need it to function. How do you navigate that? Yeah, and then really, like to me, most of the stuff that I teach and I work on myself is unlearning. Unlearning yeah. your unconscious programming you got from your parents, right? Unlearning the bad habits you picked up sitting in desks at school. Unlearning all these sort of, it's really like all my learning now is unlearning. Hmm. So how do you navigate that? Do you actively navigate that with 10? Uh, I, think, I think to me, it's about really, really being, it's about giving him as little to unlearn as possible. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, in other, so in other, in other words, uh, with, with emotions, let's say a lot of children, if their children sad or upset, um, you, a lot of parents try to say, Oh, Hey, you know, Hey, let's be happy or Hey, let's go do this. And they try to take them out of their emotions. so They can do something else. When an adult does that, it's called addiction, right? When an adult can't accept what they're feeling, they turn to heroin or work or sex, or pornography to release anxiety, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So it, when he's upset, so for example, if he's angry, I'd be like, oh, you're angry. You know, I, I understand you're angry because you can't get that uh, chocolate you want. 
uh, oh yeah, it's, it's so, so I'll sit there with the emotion and allow him to be angry and accept his angriness and acknowledge the angriness and not try to end it hmm. because it's uncomfortable. Hey, you probably know a quote from Rumi, the, 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 something along the lines of, of the solution to the pain is in the pain. Right. Yeah. You know, and so that's something that I tinker with in my own self awareness of like reaching out to fill in whatever the, whatever the thing is, it could be masturbation or it could be food or it could be whatever to kind of like dull the senses for a second. Right. Cause I feel things are building up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's a really beautiful opportunity. That's like, I heard a, a yoga teacher mention in a class one time, never waste a trigger. Mm -hmm. you know, so when great. you have like that, that trigger, you're like, oh, okay. You can go to work with it, or you can just jerk off. Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> what are you, is that something that you're cognizant of with Oh, Tom, I was having a conversation with someone about that the other day. She was saying that uh, she, I think she goes on the website Imager, I-M-G-U-R, to deal, decompress from her anxiety. Hmm. And she's like, but that's not an addiction, is it? And I'm like, well, the word doesn't matter. The question is, can you actually find ways to remove the anxiety so that you don't need to medicate it at the end of the day with whatever you're watching. Yeah. So for sure, like you're recognizing what you're, I think like awareness is the, it's so hard for people to become self-aware. I'll teach people. I try to like, I try not to do seminars. I try to only teach people in relationship over time because like you, with this deep, heavy stuff, you need to be reminded of it like a thousand times, yeah. you know, and also work it through emotionally, not just logically till, till you actually awaken, let's say, and change. But the hardest part of this stuff is people think reading books and I'm, this is an author saying this so I hate saying it but it's true people think reading books uh, will help them figure out what's going on with them they'll figure it out and they'll read the books and, and this but like literally um, you're too close to yourself to see yourself clearly mm -hmm. and um, and and the intellectual understanding is not enough to do it to, to trigger a change If you, it's almost the most frustrating thing is when you understand it but you're still fucking doing it so kind of like, I forget who said it, probably like Gandhi or something, probably misquoting it, but it's like awareness, awareness begins a change, action makes it happen. Yeah. So I think like people think self-improvement doesn't work. It's like, I know this thing, but I keep doing it. So I'm stuck. This kind of learned helplessness. Like, Hey, I know I'm doing this, but I guess we can't change. So many people think you can't fucking change, which is insane to me. It's what's the point of living. Yeah. I recently did a, are you, have you done a Vipassana meditation? Dying to do it. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's yeah. it's a really beautiful opportunity to really um, sit with those triggers. You, you can't bring a notepad. You can't bring a pen. Like there's none of it. So those all those things. It could be like intellectual outlets. One of the things that um, Guanca, I said Guanca, the guy that you watched the videotapes, he harps on, is that we don't give you any more intellectual information until you stack the the work of the meditation you know so once you're fortified with the actual meditation now we can do a little drop of intellectual yeah. stuff on top of that but culturally i think we do the inverse because it's almost easier to do the intellectual wanking yeah, <laughs> yeah. 100%. To... like if, if i like if i do like a, a three-day intensive um that's about like kind of growth and healing it's all designed to create an emotional moment where something pops so i'll really create the, this entire kind of context to really get someone in their shit. Hmm. Like sometimes you got to press the button. It's not going to be a, to get someone really deep in their sort of whatever their limiting belief is or their challenge or their frustration and really feeling it in a, the most maybe hopeless way possible. And then going to say some holotropic breath work or something where like you're in this place now for the body to do its work and for you to listen to your own signals and feel that. But it's all designed for that one moment of, sort of emotional epiphany because they, this is why of course he's I mean of course he's right and, and a lot of people who teach us say similar things that the trauma the the stuff that's going on with you you, you weren't born that way I've hmm. talked to geneticists uh, and people have the nature versus nurture argument it's in a sense it's a false dichotomy so I talked to the leading geneticist and he said that there's nothing out of behavior sense that's purely genetic Everything is switched on by something in the environment, right? Your genes are turned on by something that occurs in the environment. Hmm. And secondly is you also get to change. You can change. Um, just the older you get, the harder it gets. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. But anyway, <laughs> but, the point being, the point, but the point being is, yeah, I remember, which is so people think, well, by talking, talk therapy, reading by talking, I'm going to get the change, but this stuff is like wired and so on such a deep emotional level. Yeah. It's, you need that emotion. If you came in emotionally, it also has to go out emotionally. What's a way to tactfully guide someone into their shit? 
uh, I mean, first of all, like, <laughs> first of all, I mean, as they have to, they have to actually want to change, right? That's the number one thing is they have to want to change, right? Yeah. So, and it's not your job for them to change. So the first thing is they have to consent to wanting to change, right? Uh, I mean, but if they don't and their life is in danger, right? I, I would say a, um, an intervention and addiction is a good point of forcing someone to a bottom to get them to want to change, hmm. right? So the intervention is like, we're all your loved ones and we're fucking done with you. And not only are we done with you, but these are the ways in which your stuff has hurt me and ruined my life and this is it, you're done. So they're forcing people to a bottom. Hmm. It doesn't always work because some people's bottom happens to be death, right? So that's a way that they try to force someone to want to change when their life is in danger. But I, I truly believe that, um, that allowing one their freedom to make their own choices is a good, is a good thing in, in life. So if somebody, if somebody wants that change, then it's creating a container that's safe, right? I really think creating that safe container is important. Yeah. And, uh, and safety just means that, that uh, there's anonymity, uh, there's confidentiality, uh, there's not judgment, uh, that it's okay to be vulnerable, that they're supported, that there's professional help, all those kinds of things. So one is the safe container because we don't, we're, we're not going to be vulnerable unless we feel safe. Yeah. Uh, then the, then the, the second thing is, uh, I mean, the way I walk, the way I walk someone into it is I'll get them into the psychoeducation piece. I'll really deep dive into how, how, uh, if you think of your brain as same, say an operating system, how it was programmed, right. And what the viruses are. Right. Uh, and then if I really want to get them in there, we do work on what exactly what those viruses are, where they came from. I'll give you an example of versus using the metaphor. It's almost um, like a neurolinguistic programming tactic in a sense. Yeah, if you can so. create that visualization, then the person can go in and be like, oh, okay, it's like, it's a tool. Yeah, though not everybody's visual. Some are kinesthetic, right. some are auditory. Right? Right. But, uh, but, but yeah, it's really, and then, and then to see the consequences it's had in their life. I have this thing I've always been saying, and, and I'm sure it's not original. Um, I, think, I think every great quote is the same quote, reset a thousand times. Yeah, I was going to say, is anything original? Because yeah, everybody, everybody <laughs> it's is... It's mine. No, no, I'll, quote, I'll, I'll, write, I'll write something up on like Twitter or something. Someone will say, so-and-so said that. I'm like, of course they did because right. we arrive at the same conclusion. At the top of all wisdom, all things are kind of the same. Yeah. You know, uh, but, um, but it's that, yeah, that the human mind will do just about anything. Oh, no, that will go through two things. Uh, that people go through a lot of pain trying to avoid pain. You know, people don't want to break up because they're scared of the pain of a breakup. So they stay in an unhealthy, toxic relationship trying to make it work and making themselves and their friends miserable for years. Mm. People do an addiction, they'll be addicted to heroin or, 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 or work to, to not have to deal with their feelings. Like we go through a lot of pain trying to avoid pain. So it's, so the idea is to, let's make a three day thing that's very safe where you can go through the pain here and now together and get to the other side of it. Uh. Something I was thinking about on the way here is, uh, and we'll get to some of yeah. like the actual things. I hope we're contextualizing. Oh yeah, but 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 and so I hope we're contextualizing this. But I, but because I always just, you know, I talk about, I, you know, I think I talk about it so much that I don't know if there's a context for it. But I really, um, for myself, uh, was one of those people who just walk. I really thought as a journalist writing for Rolling Stone, as a as a guy writing books with other people, I thought I'm the same person writing about crazy people. And then I got to a place where hmm. my just relationships. Like literally my relationships weren't working. I was unhappy. Uh, and then I started realizing that it took me a fucking, it took me like two years of, uh, of people who were good friends and also just really working on me to say, Hey, look, like open your eyes, man. Yeah. Uh, and I was really, really unconscious about it. And even when I realized I was doing stuff wrong, I just thought it was me and something I could change with willpower. And the next step was actually, uh, going kicking and screaming and seeing what my childhood patterns were and how this stuff was kind of programmed into me. It's a simple example to make things concrete. Hmm. I, my parents had a horrible relationship. Um, and my mom would always tell me about my dad, would say, whatever you do, never grow up to make anyone as miserable as your dad makes me. Hmm. So, of course, I'm in a relationship. Someone's unhappy. So, I'm like, oh, I got to get them out of here. I don't, I don't want to replicate that same pattern. So, in other words, I'm sort of, I didn't even realize that that was, it seems so obvious now. But I didn't realize that was the reason my relationships weren't working. Yeah. Something I'm tooling with in myself is I think that there's like a kernel of lack of self-acceptance with, with me. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, uh, when someone gets close to really fully accepting and fully loving me in a relationship, I'll notice the tendency of kind of starting to push that away. And so I've been looking into like relationship with my mother and, and right. all those things and yeah, I think, I'm working I, it out. Right. I think the belief. I think the belief. Tell me if this is right. I mean, I think the belief is like, 
that you're not lovable for who you are. Yeah. Yeah, like if someone knew the real you, maybe they wouldn't love you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, a bit of that. Yeah. Or what do you think it is? I'm, I'm really working it out. I'm doing like a lot of journaling and, you know, things of that nature kind of explore like what, what pops up. I do it. Do you, do you, do you, you know, the, the artist's way that, yeah. that book, uh-huh. so they do the morning pages in there. Not that this is like the profound, but I find a lot of really cool stuff comes out of that. First thing in the morning, I'll, I'll write out two to three pages of right. just like free streaming consciousness. Right. Well, do you want to discuss it for a second now maybe please yeah yeah maybe now maybe it's a good example we've been yeah, talking absolutely. about earlier but like let's say um let's let's start with like the oh yeah was it let's see let's start with the mom relationship so growing up um like just tell me what your mom was like as you saw her back <clears throat> super loving um super almost like submissive mm-hmm. in a way my dad was um he's like a wonderful beautiful human being now but he was he was a uh, a bit abusive and he ended up getting addicted to crack and went to prison and he was pimping women and doing all sorts of really like very interesting experiences and um so abusive to you or your mom or both not abusive to me so much i was like the golden child Mm -hmm. but then he completely went like out to lunch like around when i was like 16 or 17 he got like very he was pretty completely suicidal like at the edge of his life right i was super surprised when he went to prison and said it died right. um and so my mom i think she was like i remember she was always just very open of like i could get away with things with her is something that stands out um super loving super nurturing i was always a little bit avoidant with disgusting anything that was like emotional Mm-hmm. For some reason, there was like, there's always been some degree, not always, but in my childhood, there was like some degree of protection around emotions, especially for like um, girls at that point or women. Right. Let, let me like, so just to, just to understand a little better. So do you think that maybe your mom was very like, it was hard for her just to have to deal with your dad and everything going on? Certainly. Right. So do you think that maybe you didn't kind of want to be a problem or an issue by sort of like keeping stuff to yourself? Maybe. I mean, I've never thought of it that way. I'd have to like, like, like stew in it. Uh, well, let's just discuss it now. Yeah, I'm, I'm stewing. <laughs> you're, 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 you've been stewing in it for a long time. The point is, like, the point is, doing the journal. That idea, though. Right, to say that, it's someone's <laughs> the same brain that got you into what you're getting out won't get you out of what you're getting out. In other words, right. how, how can a computer recognize its own operating system? Yeah. Right, so, uh, so, but you, you, but just only because you brought it up, and again, there's some other things I want to get into in what you said. Yeah. Um, but you were saying, well, I would just sort of be emotionally guarded with. Like, and then you kind of were talking about your mom, then you switched over to just making girls in general. Mm-hmm. But it seems like, obviously, your dad's going through his own stuff, so you're not going to share your stuff with him because he's pr- probably got his own. <laughs> yeah, not that a, wasn't realistic. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, and then, and then with your mom, uh, she's having a hard time with your dad, right? What was your mom's sure. kind of situation? Um, I think she was just trying to hold it together, man. Trying to hold it together. So you know, like, I don't want to be, I'm the golden child, uh, and I don't want to, like, be a, a part of another problem in her life. Could have been that. There was also, I think, some like shame around emotion. Uh, what way? For me, for some reason, I just didn't feel proud or didn't feel like entitled or empowered to like speak about feelings like I was like I would talk with my friends and such, but I didn't really have that. Like I was always intrigued by that with people that had that kind of relationship with their mother. I was, you know, I would just kind of like close that off. Because what? <laughs> Why was there shame? I'm not sure why. Well, I but I was I was a bit ashamed. Well, I'm I I'm making up that it wasn't safe to do and you knew that. That's fair. Yeah. No, yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the those, those things come from nowhere. Some people can't will say like, "Well, I was a bad kid growing up." Like, what made you a bad? How do you know you're a bad kid? What makes you bad? Because your parents told you you were bad. What really was bad? Well, they were busy and you were inconvenienced because you were just fucking being a kid. You know? Yeah. I broke things. Of course you fucking broke things. You're 10 years old running around a house playing soccer. That's what 10 year old should do. It doesn't mean you were bad. Yeah. It means your parent couldn't handle you. So my thought is that you're, you knew that your mom couldn't handle you emotionally. So you went elsewhere. Yeah. So, um, and just going off these two things, right? And again, um, what's your worst memory of your mom? Mm. probably I don't think there's a specific memory that I have but in general like a feeling of like smallness or crying type sensation 
Right. Like that she was, felt like she was small and crying. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So Which happened, you know, regularly, but you right. know, that, that sent overall overarching sensation. I think when you listen back to this podcast, it'll be interesting to hear the way you're sort of saying, well, I don't, I don't know, you know, about how you're trying to make it, it was your decision not to share stuff emotionally with her hmm. when it really does seem totally clear that she was emotionally overwhelmed. Yeah. And right. Capacity to handle your emotions. Yeah. But if you listen back and I'm, when we we're talking about awareness earlier, right? Like it was, that was, it's taken this long for you to just to see that little piece, which, which makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so here's, and I can also, and, and so, and so, I'm, this is so interesting. I, I get so excited for you. Like I really mean this. Uh, so let me think about how to articulate a few of these things. So, so one is of course, um, Oh, and there were, were there ways in which you like, you know, your mom's in this place emotionally, uh, and there's a word for this, which we'll discuss in a second, but your mom's in this place. Was there a way in which you would try to, uh, you know, help her, help her feel better? What are the things you would do? I think what I was kind of coming up, as you're saying that is, is just to like do good, mm -hmm. you know, just keep my shit together. Right. Um, yeah. Like be strong. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is interesting. Like, I think, you know, I think we talk about this, all the stuff that, uh, someone I interviewed once, it was actually Hugh Hefner. I wish it was someone else. I wish I could quote some wise person, but it was Hugh Hefner who said this. I think he's probably uh, got <laughs> some wisdom under his belt. He said it's the sand and the oyster that creates the pearl. Yeah. I've heard right. So it's all, this, all the strengths as well as the, you know, as well as the weaknesses. So I think you kind of become a strong person, right? And it becomes somebody who tries to help others because look at, look at where your, what your home was. You couldn't save your dad from, you know, death or prison. Yeah. You're probably worried. Let's, let's say you, you were worried your dad would die. So, you know, and you couldn't save him from being down that road. Yeah. You know, fortunately prison saved him from that. And yeah. you couldn't help your mom and help her get happy. And there's sort of this, uh, uh, um, and of course that creates the perfect recipe to somebody who, who takes that and then goes out to help save, heal others. The book you're doing, the work you're doing, it's all about sort of serving others and making humanity better. Yeah. Uh, and I just did a, I did an article a few months ago on Elon Musk for Rolling Stone. His dad, it's in the story, but his dad was a sociopath. <laughs> uh, and he couldn't save, uh, you know, him and his brothers from and his, and his siblings from his father. So now he tries to save the world from the ultimate <laughs> sociopath being AI. Right. This stuff all fits together and, uh, and it's great. And then how can you keep the good and get rid of the bad? And now on the flip side of it is two things. One is, of course, I mean, a child needs like love and care. And you describe your mom as it's, it's so interesting how you describe your first thing. My mom was loving. And, uh, you know, I think it's more like, but I knew when you described your dad, that your mom couldn't have been, let's say, loving in the way that a child needs because she was married to your dad. Hmm. Right. Yeah. It isn't like one person is healthy in the relationship. The other person is unhealthy. They're both unhealthy in different ways. Yeah, the pendulum swings wider. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. So your mom, uh, had a big heart, uh, and was super caring, but didn't have the capacity to handle, deal with her own, you know, emotional issues and didn't have the capacity to be a fully a mom for you in the way that you need it. Hmm. Uh, so you've got abandonment on dad's side, right? You can't save anybody. You have to grow up really quick and be strong and keep it all together for your family, right? And be not be your dad, right? It's almost like in a way you almost had to take on the dad role for your mom. Um, yes, There's something ahead. that's funny that, that pops ahead. up as you're saying that. There's like a, and I, and I recognize what it is, but there's a kind of like a natural defense as you're as you're yeah, saying yeah, like she didn't have enough bandwidth right. um but i see what that is from an intellectual you know intellectual top hat kind of information that i've gathered you know because we want no matter what we want our parents to be correct we want that to be the safe anchor point you know so even if your parents are completely derailed you know you're, you'll you'll as a child you'll find a way to reason that okay they're actually they're actually you know correct because you know, that's say, a safe place. I would say you'll do that. Not everybody will do that. Some people will really say, yeah, my, I had the shittiest dad and it was horrible. My mom was... As a child, though? Uh, oh, as a child, you don't know. You're not even trying to make them right or wrong. You're just sort of vulnerable to them. Yeah. It's different. It's different as a child and as a teenager also. They're different phases. Yeah. Like a child will be dependent 
and at a teenager will be anti-dependent. But if you, if you as a, as a child, and I don't need to be right about this, it's just some right. shit that I'm regurgitating. Um, but as a child, if you put that your parents are not the safe place, it's, it's safer for you to say like, I'm wrong as opposed to them because they're the house taking care of you. So it's like, okay, like that's, I'm not describing this very well, but, 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 it depends, but the simple answer is it depends on the family system, but there are yeah. obviously, but a child is, in other words, it depends on the family system and how it works. But the simple thing is, if you look at a child, it's like, mom, you hurt me, and then hugs mom for reassurance, hmm. right? <laughs> so, right? <laughs> to feel better. So that, that's the kind of double bind of, 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 a, right. a, of being a child. But, but no, but not, not all of them are like, I need you to be right. Yeah. Uh, some children like, are, we just realize they have a dysfunctional, messed up yeah. family system. Other people are, it, it, it's not a pendulum, but what I'm saying, but more yeah. specifically to your thing is, you, not everybody, but a lot of people, you know, there's a part where it sees it as blame for being basically here's here's what's going on with you, <laughs> which is it's easy for you to say dad was a drug addict in the jail and the bad one and mom was the good one. Yeah. Right. What we're just saying is no one was bad or good. These were different variables that affect you in different ways. You've been very conscious of the dad stuff, but unconscious of the mom stuff because you have a loyalty to the mom as her surrogate sort of hmm. semi emotional partner. Yeah, I get that. And it's breaking that loyalty, too. But it's, it's also understanding that nothing's about blame. We're all raised by imperfect people, whatever your story is, where their human beings are imperfect. And they all try their best and do their best. Most of them, let's say, 98 95% of them, some of them are just sadistic and savage. Mm. But 95% do their best given what they have, and it's not about blame. It's about owning your own reality. If you watched a movie of young Aaron with his parents, what would you be thinking and concluding from just watching the movie? I had a terrible haircut. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> my mom cut my hair. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> she wanted to yeah. I finally understand. <laughs> exactly. That's it. <laughs> so, um, so this last thing I want to add, and then we can move on to other oh, stuff. That's okay. Yeah, but you can't journal your way into this. You mm. can't journal your way into the answers or smoke your way into the answers. <laughs> smoking is journaling your way into the answers. <laughs> which is probably I didn't even <laughs> mention the smoking. I'm, I'm glad that you just assumed. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you really like you need someone from the outside who can see it like the movie without the, without the attachment. So, um, so uh, there's a word for this stuff called enmeshment, mm -hmm. right? I, I know you know what it is because you heard my other interviews, right? Yep. Enmeshment is that it's the, it's the, Parents' job to take care of the child's needs, but when the child's taking care of the parents' needs, like, again, I'm sure the emotional thing is just one thing. I think there are many others, like, um, like oh, I don't want to burden you, right? right? Uh, what that leads to later in life, it's, uh, it's almost like you're, uh, it's like the opposite of abandonment. It's sort mm -hmm. of like you almost lose your own reality because your parents' reality is more important. That's why it's harder for you to kind of get around to see the clear picture of it. Yeah. It's like you lose your reality because their reality is more important. Their emotional well-being becomes more important than your own. So at least to like, I don't know what your relationships are like. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I would guess that if someone's too neat that you get into a relationship, uh, a lot of people with enmeshment, I won't say you, but a lot of people with enmeshment think it's my job to take care of needy people. Mm. Right? And I don't have a purpose or a need as we were talking about earlier when we started this whole conversation. Well, you were, yeah, in fact, yes, that's where this all started. Um, well, I have this purpose and need to take care of needy people. Uh, um, but if that's gone, then I don't know what my use is or why I'm lovable. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot of that. Right. And that's where it <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Right? And, that, and that's where it comes from. So it went full circle from you saying this goes on in my relationships. Well, now you know the source of that. Yeah. And, that, that, uh, uh, and then the second thing is, which you didn't say, but I don't know if it's true. What often happens too is instead of thinking I fixed and healed this person, so often happens they're like they're a bottomless source of neediness, <laughs> right? And and uh, and it's draining me, and I'm losing myself. And then maybe one starts to get into you know feeling like resentment, or I'll never please them, or make them happy, and then that starts to become poison in the relationship and distance you. Yeah. You know the Tolstoy quote: "Every every family's happy for the same reason, and they're unhappy for like a multitude of different reasons." Yeah. I wonder what. Uh, with addiction, if there's some core, and I'm not trying to sidestep from referring no, we to can me, get but, other stuff, I think, but yeah, I think, yeah, but yeah. Um, and I think that was likely probably helpful for a lot of folks. I'm sure there's a lot of, yeah, I think it gives a concrete, I don't think, I think first of all, they want to get to know you better, uh, be your modeling openness and vulnerability and see it's, I was talking so abstract in the first 10 minutes that now at least they can see this, this one, -one see what that is. correspondence and understand again, I, I would guess that, uh, that a lot of your listenership, 
um, as, as any po- segment of the population in the world is not aware of enmeshment but can recognize it. Right. And, if you, and a sign of it for people listening is if you see, um, speaking of unhappy, uh, if you feel sorry for a parent while you're growing up, that's a sign enmeshment is occurring. Mm. And it usually affects your same-sex relationships. So my wife, Ingrid, was enmeshed with her mom. Hmm. Uh, it was always she was trying to save her mom from all the mom's bad relationships. So she'll take on these female friends as projects and then eventually start to kind of resent them when they get too needy. Yeah. And kind of cut them off. Yeah. Uh, so you were saying about Tolstoy, every unhappy. Yeah. Family. Well, so, so my, my curiosity is it seems to me uh, like most addictions likely stem from similar roots, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so I don't actually know what those roots are, but it, I think self acceptance is a, is a big one. You know, so when you have that time by yourself, you know, that's like when the demons tend to tend to lurk, which is why sometimes people keep themselves very busy or they, they, you know, end up, you know, whatever the thing is, you know, and then we end up praising those people in our culture, the people that have more money and more power, all that stuff. Oftentimes they're just running faster away from their demons than anybody right. else. Then we say they've gone crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but do, have praise you, them to tear them down. <laughs> yeah. Have you detected any kind of like tangible roots of addiction in your exploration? I mean, it's all like, you know, I think it's all basically we, we, we get traumatized early and we manage that, we manage that in, in, in different ways. But sure, the tangible, tangible root is family of origin trauma. Uh, and again, there's a school of just that, that says it's purely hereditary. Um, you know, and I think there's a hereditary component and there's an environmental component. Mm. Um, but also, to be clear, there's substance addictions, let's say, let's say uh, you know, alcohol, drugs, but then there's process addictions which are, which are very confusing, whether it's work or sex or, or exercise. You know, I think there are a lot of people who are in the health community for very unhealthy reasons of control. Absolutely. Like if I'm not controlling everything. Um, it's example, a good friend, and, and I think he's, I love this guy, uh, and he's also very conscious about this because he's been in the addict, addict community, Luke Story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a bud. Yeah. He's been on here. I've been on his. We've done like lots of yeah. work, uh, with him a and couple I love days him. ago. And I've like, was, we've been one of his biggest champions as far as encouraging him to switch from fashion and style to health. Cool. Uh, but, but as he knows, and he's discussed, and we've discussed it, uh, growing up, like his mom was like, I think giving him drugs, like, just unhealthy shit, putting unhealthy shit in his body. Yeah. So of course he wants to react and say, yeah, now I'm going to go to an extreme of putting only healthy shit in my body, which is what makes him so good at it. Uh, but that's all that stuff's planted early on. Mm. So the point being, that sure the root cause of addiction is is uh is an ab- inability to is being wounded in childhood and uh and not healing those wounds instead of medicating them instead but a lot of things that appear healthy on the surface are also ways of medicating it and my thought is it's not about what you're doing there's nothing wrong with doing fucking heroin you can shoot up heroin and yeah, it's a clean needle you maybe want to see what it feels like yeah. you know exactly what the dosage is you know there's nothing wrong with heroin there's nothing wrong with but if you're doing it every day and you're addicted and, and, and you're, you're stealing money, you know what I'm saying? There's, it's, right. it's why you're doing it. It's not what you're doing. It's why you're doing it. Yeah. Am I going to shoot up heroin because I'm just, I know it's a safe container. There's a doctor here. Uh, I want to experience what, I mean, morphine in a hospital is a safe way to do heroin, you know? Totally. You're, you're getting administered, you know? Uh, and same with the, if you're exercising, but you're, Someone's always, I know people exercise and they're always getting knee replacements and shoulder replacements and, 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 and going too hard and they're not doing their work and they're not present for their relationship and they're just doing this as a way to kind of avoid life, but it looks good and the world champions that. So it's not about, it's, I remember I was talking to um, Amelia Boone, the, mm-hmm. uh, she's uh, like ultra yeah. endurance athlete. <laughs> and the question was like, what are you running? And the, a lot of drug addiction in right. ultra endurance athletes. Yeah. I don't know her story, but right. with people in general, it says, I just keep running. And the ultimate thing is like, yeah. And, and it's, are you running to or are, you, or, or, or are you running from? Yeah. It's the same running. Right. It's like, are you running to or are you running from? And that lets you know whether it's a healthy behavior or like an unhealthy compulsive behavior. Do you have as much experience or do you talk about it openly with um, like psychoactive substances, plant medicines and such? Um, is that something that you... Or even have an opinion, like uh, f- with addre- addressing trauma, for example, like yeah. usage of psilocybin or ayahuasca or MDMA or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, my overall thought, it's the, actually literally the same as their therapy can be an unhealthy addiction and so can these. So the simple version is if there's something you want to work on, plant medicines are in a very safe container. Yeah. Uh, are a, you know, set and setting uh, are, are one tool to use. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Cool. And uh, But at the same time, I know people who have done so much plant medicine that they've become like uncalibrated for reality. And they, can only, <laughs> they can only hang out with their plant medicine friends, yeah. right? Because in their plant medicine world, they've all, they, you know, they, they understand how the universe works and they're going to go change it. But, like, but then they can't translate that into, um, you know, I think it's very few people who are really amazing who can really regularly be in an altered state of consciousness and still communicate with people who aren't. Yeah. Jamie Wheel. You know Jamie? Yeah. Yeah. He he mentioned something I'm gonna mess up what he said, but we've we've created kind of created like super bacteria uh -huh. by sterilizing everything. The bacteria is getting wise to it. And he's, he said he may or may not have coined this, but he said a lot of the people overusing psychedelics are creating super egos. Yeah. You know, so it's like that belief where it's like, Okay, my plant medicine you know, yeah. communion world, like they understand we've all seen Jesus or whatever, right. but no one else understands, right. you know, right. but it's like, I think that it's like, you're saying it's such a huge component. Maybe the component is being able to actually integrate that back into humanity and do your, you know, real world application. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like learn the lesson and, and, and move on. Yeah. And say, I mean, it's the same. And it's like, I think a lot of people too, addiction is like you get a peak experience of something what is a peak sexual drug plant medicine, whatever experience, then you'd spend your whole life trying to recreate that peak experience. Yeah. And you need more and more to get it. And that's addiction. So I had questions about writing. Yes. And we can wrap this thing up. What you said eleven thirty we're like we're we like go, closing in. We we're like eleven twenty eight right now, I think. Yeah, we can go. <laughs> we started late. Okay. <laughs> um so I'm in the process of doing this, doing this damn book. And uh, um I say damn book because it's hard. It's fucking hard. Hell yeah. <laughs> Someone in your single mind right there, like those things that are like pets and tears. Respect, Jesus was, Christ. Yeah, there was bit less time to conceive and birth a child and less pain. Well, I guess I didn't birth it. So. But, uh, but, um, but no, I feel like they were children. They would take so much work. Is Marilyn Manson yeah. like a really kind, thoughtful person? Uh, he's, he's super, he's very, I mean, he doesn't measure himself by those, by being kind, but he's very... <laughs> He's, I mean, he's very smart and very bright. I think very he'd have to provocative. be. I mean, but, but in, a, in, a, in an intentional, thoughtful way. Uh, yeah, and that's why when I first met him, I was doing a Rolling Stone story. I just thought he was just a poser, a fake, a phony. Hmm. So I was going to do this kind of like story exposing him. But I'm like, oh, no, yeah, he's actually, I really liked him. And we ended up doing a book together afterward. Yeah, uh, I stalked his Instagram last night uh, for the first time. I'm like, I think I like this guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's something we do. It's like he know but the fact that you're talking about him is his goal. No, I get it. That's yeah. what I was witnessing yeah. throughout the thing. Yeah. And I, my sense, a lot of times, a lot of times the people that wear on their sleeve that they're the most spiritual or they're the most kind or, you know, honest or whatever, those are the ones that I have red flags for. Yeah. So when someone goes hard to the other direction, I'm like, all right, I yeah. think, no, <laughs> I think there's something to that. <laughs> that. That people are very, this is not true in general. But in general, I kind of always say never trust a spiritual person in the material world. Yeah. But the bigger thing is I found that people who are highly religious or spiritual, it doesn't make them safer to do business with or anything else. Right. Uh, That's true. Because often somebody, and I've seen this happen a lot, they can really screw you over with a, and, and still feel like they have a spiritual religious reason to do so. Mm, in other words, like God, a religious war. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> There's exactly. the most dangerous one. Exactly. God's on my side, not <laughs> yeah. your side. Right? <laughs> like, I love when a, yeah. But anyway, but back to. So, about the, so, something that. So, I'm curious. Um, I have a, a few specific, kind of like almost sort of canned, but not really questions. But one is, is how do you get yourself, like, the kick in the pants to start writing? You know, so that's something that's hard for, I think, a lot of people. It's like, how do I start? Yeah. In the day, you know, it's like, I'm okay. Mine's blank. I want to go surf. I know that I need to do this. How do we get the juices flowing? Yeah. The, I mean, the, the, the actual answer, uh, is for me. And then we can talk about the way other people can replicate this is hard real world deadlines with actual consequences. Right. So with your book, uh, and February, books, right. It's, it's due day, on a yeah. certain date. Yeah. It's already been pre-sold to bookstores. If you get that book in late, your publisher is going to be upset. Your editor is going to be upset. The bookstores are going to reduce their orders. Your book's going to be delayed another four months. There are real world consequences. So I just find that the closer I get to a deadline, I end up working like 18 hours, like literally 18 hours a day for the last like maybe three and a half weeks. And the last like week, it's like 20 hours a day. And then I just sleep for a month. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, right, so, so, but, but for, for other people, you have to create a real world deadline with real world consequence. So for example, if someone asks me to read their book that they're working on, 
uh, I'll say, well, I'll read it, and when do you think you can get it done by? Like, give me a date, say March. I'll say, cool, if it's not in by May 15th, I will not look at or read your book. Hmm. So it has to be then done and complete. Hmm. Uh, so you have, to create, you have to create these consequences if you don't have that. Hmm. That's one. Two is, uh, like, you have to create systems to protect you from your lower self. In other words, <laughs> with a lot of things, willpower just doesn't cut it. Right? Otherwise, every diet would be, people would stick to every diet. Yeah. Uh, willpower doesn't cut it. So you have to actually uh, say, okay, I'm going to commit this time to working. Say you commit whatever it is every morning from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. or noon to write. You just say I'm taking four hours a day or every evening when you get home from work from like uh, after dinner from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. You, you carve out that window of time. Then you start doing it and you see what gets in your way. As an example, let's say you're on the internet. Uh, I, I, should, I should be like a, <laughs> a shareholder in this company, but freedom, or uh, they should be, yeah. uh, I always talk about freedom, like freedom. Uh, but it's an app on your computer and it blocks you from the internet. Uh, I feel it's not working as well in the new Mac OS though. I feel like you can just shut it off now. Mm. It used to be an ironclad, no way to turn it off. I need to make sure that's still true. Um, right. But I've noticed lately I could quit the program and it'll let me back on the internet, which it should not, you should not be able to do. But the point is uh, you find a program that completely blocks you from the internet. So if the phone's in your way, you give your phone to someone and say, don't give it back to me for four hours, you lock it in the time lock safe for four hours. If the problem is uh, roommates in your house, you work elsewhere. If the problem's getting out of your house, uh, you just tell your roommate or tell someone else, hey, I'm going to be at this coffee house in this hour or this cafe. If I'm not there, I owe you 20 bucks. The money's already in the account. You just take it. Right. Whatever it is, you find ways where there, you find willpower is great. But find ways where you don't have to use your willpower because there's no other option. Yeah. So something I've noticed about you is since, um, last year, or whatever, when I, or I, I first got to connect with you, um, you're like a more upright dude, right? Oh, good. That means a lot. That means help. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a great, great, I don't think yeah. I said anything yeah. generally the other night, but there was, yeah. I'm like, you're like, you're way more in your body Great. Thank not you. to take any, like, you oh, know, whatever, you take the credit for it. Well, whatever yeah. I could yeah. take point oh something percent <laughs> right, right, or something right, right, like right. that. But I was just, you know, I got excited because I was leading way in just now talking. No, you. seriously. Okay, great. No, really great. though. Yeah. So I wonder for you what that's, that journey has looked like. Cause it's pretty, it was really cool to, to actually have that like structural, maybe it's like an energetic change, which just shifts the structure, but I think it's, it's always both, but has there been any kind of recipe that you've been kind of? Sure. I mean, I would say for sure, I mean, working with you and, uh, and, uh, and just, it helps with the awareness. Uh, and, you know, it just helps. Okay. This is how it works. I mean, I'm always conscious of it. You talked about the way I stand. So every time, it's funny, I've always said this, and you say it in your own way. I always say about, it's about being self-correcting and always being the practice. Right. So if I'm, um, I'm not doing it now, because, uh, but that's okay. No, it's okay. Yeah. They're just different expressions. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but for example, you know, we were talking about how kind of like my knees bow out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and are they not really over my feet? Uh, or um, I guess they bow in as I'm looking at it. So bow in is the, yeah. What's that? So when yeah. I'm standing and working out or something, I'll try to like really make sure it's you know, aligned. Clearly. Cool. Uh, when I'm working out, I'll be conscious of that. So what does that look like with, with, um, working specifically? Like, cause so many people's office, whatever right. their situation is just, it's pretty bad for a lot of people. Right. I mean, I think, so I think, I think it's finding different work postures that work for me. So one is you got the standing desk right behind you. Yeah. Right. So I'll use the standing desk. Uh, the other is, um, you know, I'll be on the floor, kind of like we talked about. Sitting yes. <laughs> it's yeah. exactly. You really do that. Yeah, You're not just that. saying that. Yeah. To, that's good. Yeah. Uh, cool, so, man. So again, I really think there's a great, uh, there's a great book. I think it's called, uh, I think, I really think like the easiest way to transform is to make a very, very small commitment to doing something all the time. Yep. Right. So it's just like, I'm not going to try to do these 18 things or take time out to do these five practices every day. Yeah. You just choose one thing. I'm just going to journal every night or I'm just going to meditate every night. And I'm going to make my mission just to be aware of my posture. If I notice myself, you know, slouching, okay, I'm going to sit up and just kind of be aligned and be in a position that's good for my structural integrity. Cool. And then I think it's just, I really believe like the secret of self-improvement is small steps, small manageable steps and uh, being self-correcting. Yeah. And that's true with your beliefs too. We were talking about beliefs earlier, the belief that I'm, uh, not lovable as I am. <clears throat> when you catch that belief, right? You catch that belief. I always call it correcting the lie. The reason why we talk about the past is you realize, oh wait, no, I was born lovable. Like people are lovable, right? It's not about what I do anyway, right? I can do the most amazing things. If I'm a, you know, if I'm not a, 
uh, people pick up on that energy so you know what the truth is and you realize, oh, that's an old story. So if you get caught in that story, right away, you stop the belief right away. You throw it out of your head. I literally imagine it flying out of my head. Then I correct it with the truth. Like, I am level as I am. My uh, partner loves me for me, not for what I do for them. In fact, um, it's not contingent on that. And for so I just correct the lie all the time the same way I correct the posture. For some reason, that <clears throat> felt impactful to me, the idea of... of I was lovable as a baby. Right. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing, really paying attention to what's going on emotionally, right? It's almost like, of course, like, but the fact that that's impactful to me means that somewhere along the way I made up the belief that I wasn't. Yeah. What point was that, yeah. that intersection? Yeah. It's wild, right? Huh. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. You have, you got stuff to do. That's good. Yeah, it was fun talking, man. I hope somehow this helped your book too. I think. Oh, completely. Wanna, okay. Oh, I'm gonna. Yeah, definitely. So I'd like to. I mean, whatever. Well, you'll you'll see. You'd like to what? Yeah. I would. I, I like I said. I I think it would be really important to include some of this stuff in the um the the out of touch or whatever the heck we end up calling it. Right. Um, because that's just such a huge. It's maybe the part of health. Yeah. <laughs> you know, unless that's like studies and all that stuff. Plus, like just like general logic. If you yeah. don't feel self acceptance and connection with a community mm -hmm. is everything gets a lot harder yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, but so many people think self so many people like are looking for uh you know external acceptance and external validation and getting to the point where, where you're self-validated yeah uh, then you can actually go be yourself and do awesome you know meaningful purposeful things yeah. and not be like just a uh a drift on the sea of acceptance uh, validation and on validation constantly. Um, I was going to say something in closing. That <laughs> something to, profound. Uh, yeah, wait, 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 I'm so in the moment that I forgot what you said a minute earlier. I mean, wait, you were you were saying something about um, what did you just say? Mm, oh, just incorporating. Oh, well, the, the value of community and self acceptance and incorporating that was something like an underlying awareness of it. I'd like to grab some of that for the book. Yeah. That was something. Yeah. I, mean, I, I guess that, yeah. And I think, um, sure. We'll just do say that. That sounds like a good ending. So I, <laughs> but so I wonder for you for an ending, is there any standout point, uh, actionable steps, which is sounds like cliche and annoying to say out loud, but I think it's legit, um, towards self acceptance. Yeah. It's funny. We use these, all these words, like everyone's so fucking smart. They're like, yeah, just love yourself, man. Like, fuck you. Just be <laughs> exactly. confident. Fuck off. <laughs> right? Like seriously, right. like dude, this is a useless fucking word. <laughs> you can all throw it around and it's right, but it's not helping. Right. You know, you just saying you should love yourself is implying that I don't love myself and making the problem worse. It can create that double bind right? you mentioned. Yeah. And it's fucking, it's not like, it's like everyone, like, it's like, so, so what are the steps to self-acceptance? I think it comes back. To, I, if I was to say it super simply, it's to associate with the issue so that you can disassociate with the issue. So in other words, like, mm. I think that you choose, so if I was to say, there's like literally no, there's no easy fix because this stuff is like, been why, if someone's listening to the podcast, let's assume that they're probably like over 15, right? <laughs> so so from 15 years to like 70 years, this stuff's been wired into you. Yeah. So you can't just, someone's not going to break it with some fucking, a few words, right? Uh, so the, So I would say it's a journey. You say, if I'm on a journey to self-acceptance, I'm going to treat them like a project, like work, or like, a, like an illness, like a cancer or something like that, right? Mm. Uh, and then I'm going to get the treatments. Uh, and you were talking about uh, earlier, oh, um, how, how this, did it, does this work? Does this not work? What helps? What doesn't help? Uh, this journaling. It's like, and then I'm going to try every, if I, I'm going to try every treatment possible to start working on this. It's just going to be my intention and my mission to work on self-acceptance. That'll be my sideline to my job. And maybe, and, and if I was to say what, and then just start there. Just, it's a, it's a fucking mission. Uh, and, and you can't just put one tool at it. You're not going to just journal or just read books. You're literally, I think everything where their intentions are positive could help. Like, will healing crystals help? Maybe, maybe that'll be helpful. It's not going to hurt. Right. Yeah. But if you just do healing crystals, that might not be enough. Right. right. Um, so then I would just throw everything at it and just reduce it. I think you're trying to, you're trying to get to a place where let's just say, uh, you're not trying to get rid of it all the way. You're trying to get it small enough that you can then control it versus letting it control you. So let's say if your lack of self acceptance is at a hundred, uh, just moving it down to 49%, 
right? Say 50% is that threshold at which it just takes over and you're out of control of your behavior and your beliefs where you can start to see what it is and say, oh, oh, I see you there. Like, oh, you're not going to do that this time. You hang out over there. I'm going to go have my awesome relationship. But I see what you're trying to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to get rid of it entirely. You just have to get it to 49%. <laughs> it's and, like water uh, melting. Yeah, exactly. It's like once you reach that 32 or zero, depending on where you're at, you're like, oh, wow, it's changing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's it. And so, and so, like, and then I think the overall process is, I think if I could redo the therapy model's broken. I don't think it works. If I could redo it, you go to a primary care therapist who would say, here are the issues and here's the treatment plan you're going to have. And you're going to do these different things separate from me. And here's the beginning, the middle, and the end versus you're just going to talk to me every week for $300 a week till you get fed up and leave. Right. Um, So I would say you'd associate with it in order to disassociate with it. Some people only, I just want the positive. Like only wanting the positive is like a, is like it's like a ship a friend of mine ryan suave says this it's like a ship trying to navigate only by following the sun you're not going to get your destination Hmm. so so you associate with it in other words to say let me explore let me be an archaeologist of this where did this come from uh how did this get here so so you really kind of under being acceptance around your lack of self-acceptance and then once you figure out what are the root causes like we talked earlier with you about your relationship with you know for you i think it's starting to shine a light on the relationship with your mom and see the truth of that. Yeah, I feel that's that. That's where the trauma bonding is. Um, and then once you get understand, understanding around acceptance, then you start to disassociate with it and you do the healing work to give your mom back what's your mom's and give you who you are and the stuff you lost in your childhood. Hmm. Cool. Cool. <laughs> you got your work to do, man. All right. Um, <laughs> Every podcast from now on is be us talking about this till you're here. <laughs> Deal. Um, what's next for you? What's how do people? What's the best like access point? What's what's coming up? Um, that was an see. indirect way of asking nothing. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just I'm doing so much stuff. I'm kind of like I I guess my the two tracks I'm, I'm doing I'm I'm obviously passionate about what we're talking about. Yeah. Um and and I'm t- and and I'm tired of just sort of talking about so I'm starting these uh, um, intensives that are almost like because I'm a writer it's really what I do this is more like literally just because I think it's important yeah. uh, so th- it, uh, these sort of deep inner growth intensives where we have that emotional experience are super powerful I, I'm, I just realized that I keep uh, telling people to do it and not offering something so I'd love to maybe there's someone I'm not a uh, smart business person or a, a you know, Barker, I just, I really am a writer, Yeah. but I'm so passionate about this. I would love someone who is smart enough to work with, to help this grow and bring as many people through it as possible. I think we have not a lot of rituals in our culture mm-hmm. and bring the people to the process where they see what their first 18 years were about, uh, see how those implanted beliefs that serve and don't serve them and then have a, maybe an exorcism. It really is the process. It's so it's a lot of tears and, uh, and emotional purging is like an exorcism of your childhood demons. And then you can become an adult. There's so many children in adult bodies. It's insane. Totally. Uh, so that's one thing I'm doing that I'm passionate about. And I just realized I just have to stop talking about it and just be doing it more. Um, and so anyone, anyone, someone who's smart on that other level, I'd love to connect and talk with them about just ways to spread this knowledge. Cause, Beautiful. Because we're living in such an unhealthy culture right now. Yeah, man. It's so unha- there's so many amazing things going on that could transform the world right now that are amazing and there's so much sickness and toxicity and people taking their emotional trauma their baggage out on each other uh that i just feel like it's just such important work and people really like when new york said hey we're gonna start teaching mental health to children i think that's fucking amazing that i thought oh shit i think people i don't know if they know what mental health is hmm. not to be sort of like think that i know better than the city of new york but you know what i mean but the models aren't working so at really least it's feel. a step but yeah yeah it's a step in the race they changed there was there were schools in several different places i think at this point but they changed detention to meditation Great. which had like huge you should look up the there's like oh, news and stuff that. on it but it had yeah, huge yeah. impact on one people didn't get in detention as much but like yeah. people started like doing better on, with their grades and turning homework in yeah you know so as opposed to making it be like you know, it's, it's like we're wasting a trigger in a sense, right. you know, like, cool kid had a trigger. All right, let's spank him and like put him in a, in the corner, right. you and know, then, then or let's we make can him look feel at shame it. 
to, to then they we like have them feel shame, so they then indulge in the behavior which was shame based in the first place more often. Yeah, it's nuts. And I then stew that. with a bunch of other kids in a room that are pissed off at the system. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I love this. It's just like yeah, and it's just also, and I think under, understanding nonviolent communication, which by Marshall Rosenberg that I love. So anyway, that's what I'm doing, and then I'm writing some books that are um, and doing like a podcast. It's about. I've been solving murders on the side, but that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one access point that people should look from 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 here? Uh, I mean, my, I if guess, there is one, if you there's know, one, I guess like my main thing is like greeting area. I mean, because I'm a writer, I do the social media stuff, and I love doing, it, and it's kind of fun just to spread the ideas. But I like my mailing list because I can write longer form stuff. So right. just neilstrauss.com and on the mailing list is when like I, I'll I just write about this stuff whenever I can because I think it's important to understand and I'm a long form writer not a short form writer cool I pay attention to your Instagram too oh, I thanks. like I like all the quotes and all the stuff you put up there all the, that's there they're like it's meaningful man you put really meaningful workout great it's no, a big deal thanks and a lot of times I'm really just writing them down to remember them for myself so me too I, yeah I the same way write. that's I, yeah. I put quotes out all the time I'm like this is purely selfish so last <laughs> question, last question for you and then we're done okay um, I know you have this pre preparatory thing where you'll get stoned and write questions. What's the most stoned question you wrote but didn't ask? <laughs> I didn't do the preparatory stoned question for this one, actually. <laughs> but the most, I don't know, man. I don't know what, the, I, I couldn't answer that. <laughs> right, next time. <laughs> next time. Thank you, brother. Thanks, yeah, I appreciate fun. it. Podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning into that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. That's some ways that you can support this podcast, one of which you can pick up an Align band, which is a heavy duty resistance band, comes along with a door anchor and a carrying case, and a video guide on how to mobilize those joints and integrate that body of yours. Really great stuff. You can be found at aligntherapy.com and also on amazon.com. Um, thank you also so much for utilizing the Amazon affiliate link on the right hand sidebar of the podcast page. Bookmark that thing. Anytime you purchase some crap on Amazon, purchase that crap through that link. We get a percentage of it costs you nothing. And I think that's enough. Thank you guys so much for reviews on iTunes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Pow.